Good morning. <laughs> I want to welcome you here today. We have a couple of announcements we want to go over as we get started. First off, uh, this afternoon we have some food downstairs. I can already smell wafting up here. And uh, an afternoon service. We're looking at um, the snowplow game for the this day in history. Snowplow game. But anyway, uh, that being said, the 26th, so that is yet, is that just two weeks away? Two weeks from now, yes. It'll be the day after Christmas, but we'll have a musical Christmas service uh, on that morning, so I know it'll be actually technically after Christmas, but it'll be Christmas weekend. And uh, I know that my daughters are working on some things, and we'll be working even more heavily on things when they get home here uh, a little later. And uh, so that will be in two weeks. And then it sounded like we had some pretty good response as far, or unified response in uh, our Sunday services for January through February. Now that we've gone remote, or I shouldn't say remote, remote capable, uh, so you can watch from home a little easier. Um, I think as, as opposed to previous years where we've struggled on snow's coming, do we cancel, do we not, who's gonna be able to make it, who's not gonna be able to make it, and we're kind of sending out these surveys ahead of time of, so we know whether or not to cancel or not. And say frankly, it does help, even in the last several years, when Mr. Cole was no longer driving, because he was a determining factor many kind of times, because he would be here unless we canceled. And so there were a lot of, I would say there was a lot of times we canceled the services for only one reason, Mr. Cole. <laughs> there you go, that's right. <laughs> so now we are, because of this setup that we have, and I guess we could say thanks to COVID, uh, our plan is, as long as we have electricity, internet, and heat here in this building, uh, we will have at least a Sunday morning service, uh, January and February. And in fact, we've determined it will be only the Sunday morning service, January and February. Uh, and then we'll leave that decision up to you whether or not you want to go out. If it's bad weather, um, I would caution you in going out. Um, to always play it on the safe side if necessary. Um, but we'll have the opportunity then to stream it and you can watch it from home and, and go from there. If you'd like to come, we will be here. Uh, if you don't, we'll still be here. <laughs> and and uh, I, think, uh, I think what changed is the, what was it, six weeks that we had of nobody here except my family and uh, still continuing to have services week after week with just uh, my immediate family. Uh, we decided, hey, we, I think we could do this. And uh, so that's our plan for this year. So January and February, starting in, in fact, probably starting this December 26th. We probably will just stop the afternoon meals and services uh, since that's Christmas weekend. And then the next one will be New Year's weekend. Uh, a lot of times there's things going on at family events. So we may, unless I hear differently, uh, we may just stop the uh, afternoon meals and services on that Sunday and uh, go from there and get back to it in uh, March. Unless we have a a seasonably warm uh, Southern California style Christmas and winter. Uh, we may call it back before then, but uh, I, we are still in Illinois, so I doubt that will happen. We'll communicate. Then as well, uh, January 16th, uh, now that I say we have no afternoon services, <laughs> January 16th uh, would be scheduled our annual business meeting. Uh, we may do like last year where we just do a few quick things after the, the service. Uh, if you are not here, that may become a little more difficult, but we can work, we'll work something out that way and uh, go from there. And uh, then as well, jump into March, which will be here much sooner than we think. Uh, the corral will be here. And we'll have to figure out some way to get 40 to 50 people up here. And it would be great to have 40 or 50 people out there uh, to uh, hear them. And uh, looking forward to that as well. Only other announcement I posted yesterday, if you are interested in being a part of uh, raising some money for a laptop for a professor at Maranatha, uh, we are certainly accepting donations in that regard. Um, we're thinking we're going to be dropping this off probably on Thursday. We're going to be back in Wisconsin on Thursday, take Kate back for a final exam for her, or a, we call it a hands-on, there's no name for it, for an EMT test, but it's the hands-on part of it. <laughs> CPR part of it, if you picked up on that. Um, but anyway, so we'll probably be dropping that laptop off on Thursday uh, there at Maranatha. And if you want to be a part of that, that would be a great blessing on our behalf, uh, but as well, I trust on his behalf as well. Other than that, I don't think we have anything else. 
far as the prayer requests, we have a couple added to our app. Uh, Jeremy Suley, which would be a nephew of mine through my wife, uh, begins Army basic training on the 27th. And then uh, the Jean and Jean. AJ begins his journey back, or I shouldn't say back because he hasn't been there yet, uh, to North Carolina, uh, Camp Lejeune. Uh, we were laughing that we we're going to have two boys, two sons at a camp in North Carolina. <laughs> Once, one, <laughs> one slightly different than the other, perhaps. Um, and then the even kind of as, as equally funny, last night we were discussing his two point, he was going to drive all the way through and he decided to turn it into two days of driving, so which allowed him to be here today. And uh, his mother made a, asked me, oh, are there going to be any cities that he probably shouldn't stop at for the night? And I'm like, he's a Marine. He, he spent a year in Istanbul and a year in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, granted, he won't have the Iron Dome over the uh, motel that he stops at, but yeah, he's a Marine. He's, he's on his own there. <laughs> My, my only recommendation was don't stop at Uncle Bob's side, side street hotel. That might be a little questionable, but other than that, it uh, should be good to go. But anyway, he'll be heading out here this afternoon, probably right after our services, and uh, heading to North Carolina, which will be a change for him because he's not used to lots of people surrounding him, sometimes yelling at him. <laughs> any others? I don't know if anybody else. Yes. Um, is having her surgery on Wednesday. All right. And then another challenging part is she will have to be still for the police. Oh wow. And she, I mean, I think it would be hard enough if, if she were the only child, but then she has lots of siblings. So she will be able to be home. During this be still time. I think at some, yeah, at some point she'll come home during the pitch, but she still has to be, I think so. I was assuming so, but I don't know now that I say that. But she just, you know, two years old, you move. And you don't understand, you know, that you can't. And so that's two years old is a hard age for that. So, big prayer. Wow, yes. Do we have any others, right? I shared just the continued prayer for my mom. This has yes. a goal for her, and I appreciate everyone praying. And she had a good visit with a physical therapist since that uh, request I shared, but it's still a matter of like being able to bend the knee to a certain degree just using the knee strength, so that's the concern there. The physical therapist could do the all bend knee, but they, they need her knee to do it. So they set a date that... 
Yes. She's had a positive, um, but it's just her long road. Yes. And a lot yes. Of Very true. Oh, okay. Well, finally, and um, so far it's doing okay. I would like to put Nam back on the prayer list. Um, his mom posted yesterday and, and again today. Uh, he is in the hospital. He is having um, difficult sleeping, intense and numerous full body spasms and vomiting. He's having seizure-like episodes. He seems to feel bad often as a rash all over his body. He's not interactive or responsive much, and he's generally not happy. And then the one today said that the EEG, which is brain waves, mm -hmm. came back, that these are not seizures, and now the doctors are completely baffled as to what's causing these spasms. Wow. Wow. So she said, Felt like all the air had been sucked out of the room when she heard that. Yes. Now, now what? I'm back at ground zero. But she said that they're not getting much sleep because it's just going and getting these problems. Wow. Hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for who you are, and even though there are Many that we just shared that are going through some struggles, that are going through some trials. Uh, I do thank you that you are there, that you are more powerful, that, that there is even good, even though at times we can't foresee it. Um, but we thank you that you are in control. And uh, I just pray that you certainly be with uh, Jeremy uh, as he heads off to the army here very soon. I pray that you give him the strength and the health between now and then, as well the endurance once he he, uh, he begins, and uh, we just pray that you put your hand of protection upon him. And then certainly for Jean and Jean, uh, both with different needs and circumstances, I pray that uh, you'd be with Jean there in the hospital with the strokes and all those details. I just ask that you would enable them to find a remedy that um, she might be able to get home and, and be able to move forward in that regard. But I pray that you give them both the strength, both the encouragement that they need, even right now in this moment. And certainly for AJ, as he's heading out here this later today, I pray that you give him safety as he goes, and as well the new adventure there in North Carolina. I pray that you give safety and, and health there as well. And for Taz, as she goes in for the surgery on Wednesday, I pray that you would just guide uh, those surgeons in, in every step of that procedure, but as well that you would be with Taz and the requirements of, of the being still uh, for a number of weeks, uh, I just pray that you would give even the patient, the parents the patience that is necessary uh, as they go through this process as well and all the siblings that are involved and just all those details that you are certainly aware of certainly do not take you by surprise, but I just pray that you would, that your very presence would be felt uh, there. And then for my brother, uh, we thank you that he is getting better. I pray that you just continue him on that road to recovery and uh, that he be able to get back into the full swing of things. And uh, for Emily, as the potential of being released today, but I just pray in all the details and even the uh, necessary weight that needs to be gained and uh, potentially even the continued road ahead, I, I just pray that you would give the grace that we know is always sufficient, always super abounding, and we thank you for that. And for my mother-in-law, as she's uh, still recovering from this knee surgery and, and certainly the the requirement that she has of being able to bend her knee, I just pray that you would give her the uh, ease and pain, and then as well the, uh, the ability, the strength uh, to be able to uh, meet these parameters that have been set, that she'd be able to continue moving forward and, and getting that mobility and, and getting that strength back. And uh, we thank you for what you will do. And for Marlene, as she begins her oral chemo here, uh, I pray that you give her the, the health and the strength that she'd be able to accept this and not uh, get knocked back down again. And, and we just pray that you would that you would just remind her as well that you are there and uh, right there alongside of her. And we thank you for that very assurance. And then as well for Nahum, uh, certainly a lot of concerns as far as his health and all that's going on and seemingly no answers right now. Uh, we certainly are thankful that you know the answer. You already are aware of what's going on. Uh, but I pray that you would be with his family as, as they wait 
as, as they search uh, for answers. And I pray that you would direct the doctors, direct those that are caring for him, uh, that they'd be able to find a remedy, be able to find a way to get him on the road to recovery. And uh, we thank you for what you'll do there as well. Certainly there are other requests on our screen, certainly others in our hearts. And we certainly know that uh, perhaps there are even circumstances yet today that we will all face. But I, I pray that you would remind us of who you are and uh, challenge us in our, in our walk, in our trust, our faith in you. And we give you the glory for it. And as we give here in just a moment, I, I do pray that you would uh, just bless the gift and the giver and that you would uh, bless and multiply beyond our means as we continue your ministry here in Toulon. We give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good. We want to stand as we sing. Uh, I think this is our first Christmas song. Not the first one we've heard, obviously, but the first one we will sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing 106 in our hymnals, and we'll sing the first, second, and third. on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the Christ. And the Holy Ghost proclaim, Christ is born in that land. All angels sing, glory to Heaven adored, <clears throat> late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the God and sea, veiled in carnate deity, and to dwell, Jesus, our Amen. seated and this time we have special music. Thank you. 
good. We're going to be in Deuteronomy again here this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 8. I guess another prayer request we could have shared as well is uh, my daughters are starting their finals tomorrow, and uh, I think they're hoping to finish their finals tomorrow, so we'll see how that all works out for them. If I recall, because they did all the uh, dual credits in, in high school, in the last couple of years of high school, um, I think they were only like one class, maybe two classes away from uh, finishing their freshman year. So I suppose in that regard, the moment they finish their first final, they are technically sophomores. That's how that works out, as far as on paper anyway. Um, but anyway, so that begins, and then I have a final as well, which does not look like it will be any fun at all. Uh, and so that all has to be done before Wednesday for my daughters and I. And uh, so we'll see how that goes uh, here this week. But Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, we're going to be looking at the, uh, uh, the thinking in regards to um, can I see the blessing in the midst of trials? Or we can almost say it in a participle way, seeing the blessing in the trials. But there is a, a thinking that has to be involved. There's a mindset that has to be involved in order to see, oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself there, in order to see the trials as blessings. And I think here Deuteronomy chapter 8 gives us a couple of ways. Uh, in fact, one of the verses here at the very beginning of the chapter gives the three points of the sermon outline right there in one verse. Uh, but the rest of the chapter seems to kind of expound on those three points. And uh, so we'll look at that here this morning. But before we do, let's begin with the word of prayer. Do we thank you again for your word. We thank you for our time together. I pray again that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I just ask that you be able to challenge us in this topic of, of being able to see your hand, be able to rejoice in your blessings, even in the midst of trials, in the midst of circumstances that would otherwise be classified as not convenient or pleasant, but that we be able to see your hand, be able to see your blessing uh, surrounding it. And uh, I just pray that you give us eyes, to give us thinking uh, that would see that blessing in the midst of trials. And we thank you for our time together. I just pray that you challenge us now. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a man named F.E. March. I don't know him. Do you? Does that name sound familiar? I don't know anything about him. He was a part of a movement that I had never heard of either. So I, I'm referencing him only because of something that he said I think is excellent. The rest of what he said may not be because I don't, I don't know him. So uh, this is not a promotion, but... And to get it all on the screen, that had to be small fonts. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this as well, uh, but I will read that. Uh, he created a, a list of blessings that could be applied to life, at, applied to our lives, regardless of what we're facing. Uh, almost as a, uh, you can almost say it this way: how to be thankful in all things. Here's a here's a, a list of things to be thankful for in all in all areas. We have through Christ, if we are a child of His, we have an acceptance that can never be questioned. Uh, from Ephesians 1 6. We have an inheritance that can never be lost. We have a deliverance that can never be excelled. There's, there's, not, there's, there's no better option <laughs> uh, other than what deliverance we have from Christ. We have a grace that can never be limited. We have a hope that can never be disappointed. We have a bounty that can never be withdrawn. We have a joy that never need to be diminished. We have a nearness to God that can never be reversed, a peace that can never be disturbed, a righteousness that can never be tarnished, and a salvation that can never be canceled. And I, I thought that, I, again, I don't know anything about this guy. Uh, I remember seeing, I looked him up, and I forget what movement he was a part of. It was one that I had never heard of. So it may very well be Pentecostal or, you know, something along those lines. And uh, so... He may be a great guy, he may be a strong hero of the faith from the past, but uh, I don't know. Uh, but I can say that these, however many bullet points those are there on the screen, I, I thought were some excellent ones. And uh, uh, unlike a lot of the people of the past, his hair doesn't seem too out of control, so we'll give him those marks as well. But have you ever had the thinking that I'm just not sure how I can see God's hand, God's blessing, God's presence, in this trial that I'm facing, I don't know how I can, how I can move forward, counting it all joy, as we're told in, in James, in the midst of, fill in the blank, this, whatever that this might be. 
I'll give you a couple of illustrations. In fact, on a funny side, one of my classes I am taking that is not finishing this week, I had to write a fictional, it's for a counseling class, uh, the difficult tasks, the difficult counseling, uh, what do you call that, scenarios. Uh, it's called Counseling Problems and Procedures, uh, but it covers all the, the challenging ones. And so we have a list of some really challenging topics to counsel somebody on. And we had to come up with a fictional character and basically write out a, a scenario for their life and then as well what we would do to help them, which as one of the uh, students in the class asked the teacher, how do we do that when we're the ones creating the scenario? Like, that's really hard to do. Like, we created the scenario and now we have to figure out how to solve the scenario. How, how, does you, how do you get your mind to do both sides of that coin at the same time? Uh, well, anyway, it was only had to be six paragraphs. He just wanted to see that we could come up with a scenario and, and have the correct biblical direction uh, to resolve that. Well, I kind of got carried away. I think it turned into like seven pages. And I had my wife read it. And uh, she was nearly crying. And I, I'm waiting for the movie to come out because... <laughs> <laughs> it was on uh, uh, PTS, or as it's often called, PTSD, depending on how severe it is. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, I'll try to not have seven-page uh, uh, scenarios here. But as we have considered trials, have you ever found yourself in a difficult situation that it would be challenging to see God? Our prayer list that we had up there on the screen certainly has some uh, of valid candidates that it would be hard stepping into their exact shoes. Imagine being Nahum's mom right now. Um, to be able to see God, you know, Lord, what are you doing? Well, what's going on and how's this working out? Can I just add this? Her name is Sunshine. Well, that's right, yes. And the post that I got this morning said that there was a lady who also had a child in the same unit and they were just sharing in the waiting room and the lady said to her, I can't even imagine a tree lamb falling on my child's head. I have strength from the Lord, but I am back. Wow. Story. So, yes. That's kind of an example. Yes. She's been sharing the gospel while she's there with this child who's never going to be normal again. Yes. Exactly. And what a, what a, uh, a praise on her testimony on, on that behalf. But I can say that there'd be a lot of parents that couldn't handle that test. Uh, they would crumble at it. And, and frankly, I think there's several instances where um, there are times where it is difficult. And certainly our list at times has come up with those exact details. We know 1 Corinthians 10, 13 probably too well. In fact, we probably know it because it's used so many times out of context. But there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. If you could make the, the comment of the main theme of that verse, that's those words right there, but God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. I know I've said this too many times probably. Well, let me say it again because what we hear that verse or how we hear that verse used, I believe, is incorrect. This verse is not saying that we will never face something that is too difficult. This verse is not saying that we won't be living through the reality of a, was he five? Seven. Uh, uh, however he was when this accident happened, was that just this year? Six, yes. So imagine living through the reality of a tree limb falling on your six-year-old's head while he's enjoying being outside playing on that swing and the road that they've had since. Um, God is going to at times allow things that are potentially big enough to knock us down. But what this verse is saying is there is nothing that will ever be so big that we have to be knocked down, that we have to lose sight of our God. We will never face anything that we will lose sight of God's faithfulness. It will probably be, in fact, I would dare say with AJ sitting here, I would dare say that boot camp would be one of those scenarios where, yeah, this was a little more than I've ever gone. I've, I've been pushed to the limit and then like three miles beyond that. But there is nothing that we will ever face that we are forced to say, there is no God. Now, sadly, people come to that conclusion. 
But there's never anything that we're going to be so big that we lose sight of God. And the very next verse, verse 14 says, Wherefore, flee idolatry. In other words, stop putting other things as your primary focus. Put them back on God. Because there's nothing that you will ever face that will require you to lose sight of your God. Have you also ever found yourself in a situation that demanded obedience to God, but you really weren't sure how you'd be able to pull it off? You weren't really sure how you're going to get through that situation. Uh, it could be something in your job. It could be something in your marriage and child rearing. Um, scenarios in which God's word says, here's what you should do. And we look at it in the application of where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And we say, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I can live that out. I don't know if I have that boldness. I don't know if I have that love. I don't know if I have that desire even at times. Can we still follow God in obedience, even in the midst of, I don't know that I can. This is going to be hard. I'll give you an illustration. I already mentioned the, uh, the laptop uh, scenario uh, with one of my professors. Um, give you some back. Let me give you an interesting uh, sideline story, just uh, on my side of things. This is going. Um, I'm starting here in just a month, starting my last class for my first grad degree, and, and to this point, I technically have not had to pay for any of it, which is quite amazing. Uh, now, granted, I've had to put a lot of money on my account at Maranatha. Uh, but the first 10 credits that I had back, started back in 2002 and 3 were free. Uh, the seminary was offering first 10 credits are on us. So I took 10 credits and then stopped <laughs> uh, because we couldn't, have, especially at that time, could not afford anything beyond the first 10 credits. So I got 10 credits done all for free and then stopped. And then uh, we decided last year, you know, I, I needed to just finish that. Uh, it's been too long and I just need to get it done. And uh, so we started and unbeknownst to me, well, we started because we had a good tax return, and I said, well, I'm just going to use that for money, for tuition, and we're going to spend that tax money, which, and at our income, we don't get a tax return. We get a child credit because <laughs> uh, there's not enough tax being paid or, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyway, so it was all government money. It was, it was more than I've put in I got back because of our, our kids. And so I spent that on, on tuition. Well, then, as I'm finishing up my first round of classes, then the government starts handing out money, if you recall, last year. And again, because of my kids, uh, we get money because of them. So uh, uh, as it came in, I just transferred it right on to Maranatha and continued to going. And then this last summer, I ended that. They stopped, the government stopped their payment. And as well, um, we ran out of that government surplus money, whatever that was called. And uh, then lo and behold, I got this scholarship for this semester, which required me to be full time. Uh, but all of it was paid, I think. I wound up having to pay like $176 for the whole semester of full-time students, so that, what a blessing that was. Well, this semester begins my first time that I'm actually having to pay money that the government didn't already pay me, which I think is fantastic that the government has almost, to the most part, paid for a grad degree in theology. And I, I, I think i uh, kind of tempted to send Biden a thank you note to see what he would do. That might get him into a good stammer. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless... Uh, here this next semester, here in just a few weeks, I've got to make my first tuition payment that we haven't been paid first before paying. And uh, in, in conjunction with that, I've had a, a tooth issue going on for years that I knew was going to be expensive. Uh, and so I haven't dealt with it, and uh, it got to the point where I had to deal with it. And we went, I went to the doctor a couple, two weeks ago, to the dentist. And uh, they have to do surgery, and uh, it's going to be... Let me just say this. Of probably the eight cars, this ballparking, eight cars that I've owned, I think I've only had one that cost me more than what this is going to cost me. And uh, so here, tuition starting, tooth starting, and uh, the rain the other day when we were out driving reminded me that we have got some bald tires on our way. So all these things are coming down, and I'm watching class last week. And uh, the teacher is struggling teaching from home because of his laptop. And immediately the Lord put on my mind, you've got to take care of this. There's something that you, you're just going to have to do this. And I remember having this little argument saying <laughs> all the time, normally I don't have the money to buy a laptop. Uh, uh, you know, my laptop is not uh, certainly new by any means. Uh, I don't have the means to do this. 
And uh, right now, with tuition and a tooth and tires and all the other things that just continue to, to pile up uh, as part of life, um, this is not, not the best time at all. Um, but isn't it amazing that when the Lord puts something on your heart that you just say, all right, am I going to obey you? Or am I just going to give the excuse that, well, I can't, so someone else is going to just do this. Like, Lord, there's a reason why you put this guy and this need on my heart, and, uh, and uh, I'm not looking for glory. In fact, I'm trying to do this anonymously, but um, there's a reason for this. And I can tell you the excuses are easy to say as well. Nah, I, I really can't. I can't have a part of it. This isn't going to happen. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that um, some money has come in from other places and, and uh, looking forward to see what God will do. But I can say that there are times when we look at what God has called us to do, it is easy to say, I don't have the money to do that. I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the resources to do that. I don't have, maybe it's the boldness to do that. I don't have the perseverance to see this through to do that. Uh, whatever the excuse is, there are going to be times where we are looking at life and what God has called us to in that life and say, and try to call a timeout and say, whoa, can we bargain with the rules here? Can we bargain with the requirements here? Because I don't think we can do this. Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto you, your fathers. You're going to get tired of me hearing this, but Moses is reiterating over and over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy their covenant relationship with their God. You have to obey so that these things take place. This is not the first time he said that, and this will certainly not be the last time he says this. This is all based on their covenant relationship that they have with God as a nation of Israel. Verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord your God Led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or, as the King James says, or no, I would say, or not. Are you going to obey or are you not going to obey? Now, let me just stop right there, there in verse 2. These are children that have, as it says there, thou shalt remember all the ways of the Lord your God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. I would dare say that probably most of the ones that are hearing this from Moses' mouth in this moment, in real time, Deuteronomy time, they are on the border, ready to cross into the promised land to start the battle that lies ahead of them. And Moses, before his death, is sharing this message to them. A lot of it is replaying history, but in real time, this is at the end of 40 years. He is speaking to a majority of people who are under 40 years old. And he's saying to them... Remember what God taught you in the last 40 years of your wanderings. Now, there could be somebody who's 20 years old right at this moment, and, and their mindset only goes back 10 years, 15 years. And, but yet, again, it goes back to how many times already we've heard Moses telling the parents, make sure your kids know, make sure your kids know, make sure your kids know. Here is the application of it. You need to remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Even if you're not 40 years old, even if you have not wandered all of those years, even if you were born during that time frame, remember what God did for you. Now, that also I want to look at the phrase, in the wilderness. <laughs> There's nothing pleasant about in the wilderness. Remember all the blessings of God while you were, quote, in the wilderness. That's kind of like saying, remember all the blessings of God while you were visiting the dentist. <laughs> remember all the blessings of God while you were taking college finals. Remember all the blessings of God while you were sitting on the side of the road with a broken down vehicle. Do you remember the blessings of God in those moments? Because that's what he's directing them to do. Remember the blessings of God while you wandered in the wilderness many times hungry, many times thirsty, many times to the point where you are complaining and crying that you wanted to go back to Egypt. It was so bad in that wilderness time frame that some hearts wanted to go back to Egypt as slaves because they viewed it as better scenario than what they were living in that moment. And Moses says to this group, remember the blessings of God in those wilderness experiences. Uh, I recall a number of years ago in that blizzard, what was that, like 
2012, 2011, somewhere in there. Somewhere in that time frame, uh, we had gone and picked up a load for Cherry Tree, and we're bringing it back. And while we're, while actually we were eating at uh, what was that restaurant called? Yoders. We were yoder, yo, we were yodering uh, in Arthur, Illinois. And on my phone, I get this ding, and I look at it, and it's calling for a blizzard warning. Uh, obviously not for them. It was the, literally the sun was shining in Arthur, Illinois, and my phone is ringing that there's a blizzard warning back home. And uh, so we quickly wrapped up lunch and uh, jumped back in the van and uh, hustled back to town. And as we got to probably about the Bloomington area, it started snowing. By the time we got to Peoria, I think I texted Joe and said, these windshield wipers are old and they are not keeping up. I'm going to have to stop and buy new ones. And uh, I think he gave me permission by text. And so we stopped at Walmart and I ran in and got uh, upgraded windshield wipers because I could not even see the road. It was just so much goop and everything yes on the windshield and then we continued on and we made it and keep in mind I'm driving a full-size van with a loaded trailer behind us on these roads that are turning to ice and then snow and we got to Bradford and and uh, we wound up I thought well we're close enough home let's just our normal routine was we get back and we unload the trailer and I think we did that it seems like we thought well you know we're in Bradford we're not in Arthur anymore we're practically home let's just unload the trailer and we'll hit the road well that was probably the mistake because by the time we got the trailer unloaded, there were no roads left, and uh, we had to get home. Now we're going the route from Bradford to Elmira was ridiculous. Uh, uh, the, the windshield wipers on full speed uh, was not enough to keep all the, 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 the slop of the road off of our windshield. There was not another car in sight, and uh, the road was quickly disappearing. Now, for a lot of that journey, there's trees alongside the road. So you could gather where the road was because there's a tree there and there's a tree there, the road somewhere in the middle. So you could aim it. By the time you get to Elmira, it goes into fields. And you can no longer see where the road is because there's no trees kind of giving you the pathway of the road. And I think it was like maybe a half a mile before Elmira, we came to a stop. And I said, I can't see the road. I literally have no idea. We could be right in the middle of a field right now for all I know. I can't see houses. I cannot see driveways. I cannot see mailboxes. There are no trees around. I don't know where we are. So I literally stopped, put the van in park, and I got out. And, and uh, yeah, we all got out, and we just kind of drag, dragged our feet to find where the road was and where the uh, center line is. And then Jen got back in and started driving as I just kind of trudged on the center line. And uh, when I got, because the wind was like 40, 50 miles an hour, it seemed like. Uh, when I got to the point where I could no longer even close my eyes to blink because my eyelids were frozen open, I got back in the van and we all started taking turns. AJ got out for a while, my wife got out for a while, and, and then that continued. Uh, while I'm driving and seeing AJ or Matt, I don't know if Matt ever got out, but AJ and Jen, the wind was so strong that, and the roads were so bad that they're literally being blown across the road. They'd be standing still and the, the wind is just, I'm like, their feet aren't moving, but they are moving. <laughs> And uh, uh, I recall a very, very long journey home. And uh, pretty much the entirety of the six-mile road then out here was done with somebody in front of the van scraping their feet on the road just so that we would stay on the road. And there were times that as I would be out, I would turn around and stop Jen so she stopped moving and because there'd be a car out in the field. And I'd run out there and say, hey, we've got a warm van. You need to run. No, I'm fine. People turning us down. No, I'm fine. Uh, uh, there's somebody coming to help me. And I was like, there's no road out here. You're not getting help. You, you want to jump in our van? Because I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'd like some more people to do some shifts. <laughs> no, we're fine. And, and you feel horrible leaving them. But here we go. So, you know, another so many yards, and there's another car in the ditch, and stop and knock on there. You want to get in our van? We're heading into town. No, I'm fine. I got somebody coming. Same thing. You're, nobody's coming for you. <laughs> You're on your own. Get into our van and we will take you into town. I'll take you to the fire station. It'll be warm. You can rest and get your car tomorrow. Nope, we're, we're waiting. When we got home, I was so cold. We have pictures of this. I got, in, I got out of my wet clothes, got into some dry clothes and numerous layers of clothes. Got under our, the covers of our bed and I think the kids went around to every other bed in our house and got the blankets off. So I'm literally like this much blanket. I'm, and I, it was so heavy, I couldn't move. But I'm still under. I'm just <laughs> and I knew that everything in me wanted me to get up in the shower. But I knew that that would be bad to go from that cold to hot. So like, I at least got to get to the point where I'm not shivering. So it took like a good hour. I'm just in my bed just shivering all these blankets 
so I could finally get into the, get a hot shower. Now, at the end of that time frame, we were laughing, and that was quite an experience, and we survived it, and we got home, and so there was something to rejoice in that regard, and I believe as even as we pulled into the driveway, we were praying and thanking God that we got made it. But in that moment, had someone call us up, you know, say, for instance, Joe. Joe called up and said, hey, you make it home? Yeah, we did. Well, wasn't it great to see the buses of God? Mr. Miller. <laughs> You weren't out there getting your eyelids frozen open and then the wind just burning your eyeballs because you can't even blink because they are literally just frozen and, and your lips are blue. The blessings of God, really? We know there are times in the wilderness that it is not normal. It is not humanly normal to see the blessings of God. But Moses wants to make sure that they do. And he gives them three kind of quick, very quick points there in, in that verse. Um, let me read it again. Thou shalt remember all the ways of the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in your heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or not. First point, how can we learn humility? It's not a fun process, I'd say that. But why did they have to learn humility, or how did they... How did they learn humility in the wilderness? How did God humble them? Verse 3. And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man that does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Just the first part of verse 3. How did God humble them? No, humility isn't always just about God knocking our feet out from under us so that we realize we need our dependence upon him. Our humility can even be in the way that he responds to our needs, in the ways that don't make sense, in the ways that we never imagined, in the ways that how did this happen? How did, how did this work? Uh, here's the problem. How does it make sense that a literal lamb could take away the sins of the world, of the nation, of, of Israel. And then how does it make sense going into the New Testament that Christ, a, a, as far as man's eyes see, a human being's death could take away the sins of the world? You know, it takes great humility to understand even just the gospel message. Not only a humbling in reality to know that we are sinners and we are in need of a Savior, but isn't it also humbling to realize, in fact, people struggle with this, to realize that what Christ did is all that was needed. There are, I mentioned Arthur already, there are Amish that uh, if you ask them if we are uh, saved, they will tell you no. I don't know that all Amish will do that, and I think there's a, a trend of kind of more uh, uh, carnal Amish, carnal Amish, Amish, have I said that right? Uh, but anyway, if, if you talk to a devout Amish person and you ask them if, if we are saved, their answer will be no. Why? Well, because we're meeting in a heated building with lights on, because we have uh, microphones, because we have cell phones and, and uh, iPads, and, and we're on the Internet, and, and there's no way that you could be saved like that because that's carnality. That is connections with the world, and, and you cannot be saved and, and do that. Here's, here's the struggle. It doesn't make sense that the Lamb of God is enough. Can you imagine waking up that first morning? Can you imagine waking up that first morning and looking out on the, the ground and all that you see is manna? Who was the first one that tasted it? Who's the first one? I, I've got to think it was a big guy that says, I'll taste it. <laughs> I'm hungry. Well, who was the first guy that went out there and said, I wonder what this tastes like? Can you imagine the faith that's involved? I, I, uh, oddly enough, my wife took a picture of it this morning. There's a dandelion in our yard. No idea how, what, what, what's going on there. It's a very confused dandelion, I, I would dare say. There are people that, and if this is one of you, I'm not, I'm not picking on you, but there are people that eat parts of the dandelions. A neighbor two doors down once gave us dandelion jelly, I think. I, I can attest I didn't try it. 
who was the first one that picked the flower out of the yard? You know, your yards get full of dandelions in the spring. Who was the first one that said, I wonder what this tastes like? And then who was the one that determined that parts of a dandelion you can eat and the other parts you can't? I want to know who that first person was as well. <laughs> You know, the, the truth is, it took great faith because literally, manna, what is it? But God said, eat it. You know, I kind of will need to know the details. What's the calorie count of this? What, what, how, how many sugar? You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm pre-diabetic here, I, and so I need to know what's the sugar level. Or I, I have a cholesterol. Is there any cholesterol in this? You know, what's, what, what's, I want to know what this is. God said, Eat. And they had no idea what it was they were being fed, but they ate. God humbled them by not only bringing them to a point of hunger, but by meeting their needs in a way that they couldn't connect the dots. But they had to make a decision to obey. And that, it probably wasn't a hard decision because it was either you eat or you're going to die of hunger. So we'll try this. But still there was a reality of, I don't know what this is. What is it? Just eat? There's still, you read through the word of God, there's still no indication of what that was. I, I would love, you know, here we're in the New Testament. Why doesn't God give, why didn't God give a New Testament writer the, the ingredients of what the manna was? We, we have no, it could have been dandelions. They walked out, you know, this is how dandelions work. You walk out in the, the morning and there they are. You cut them all down and walk out the next morning. There, it could have been dandelions. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Is this good for us? You know, the, the, the reality is, is God humbles us in the midst of our trials, and it's not just about, I can't handle this. It's about God saying, I can, and here's the answer. Our salvation is the very reality of that. I can't handle this, and God says, but I can, and here's the answer. And it takes great humility to say, I will, I will go with that. I will follow that answer. I will admit and live by the reality that the death of Christ was all that is necessary for me for my salvation. End of discussion, end of sentence. Nothing more is needed. There are literally millions of people now within, quote-unquote, assumed Christianity that still struggle with that very reality. We can't accept the fact that the solution that God has given to our greatest problem of sin is this simple. It doesn't make sense. I am not accepting it. I've got to add to that this, and this, and this, and this. God humbles us. There's a lot of trials, I believe, that God is still humbling us, not just in the reality of, I can't handle this, but in the reality of God saying, watch how I meet this need in a way you never expected, but you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to eat that white stuff that is lying on the ground because it will be fulfilling, it will be fulfilling and fulfilling for you. Secondly, it says here again in verse two, to humble thee and as well to prove thee. It has the idea of learning the humility, but we also need to learn how to pass the test. Passing the test. Here in the rest of this verse, to know whether it was in thine heart, verse three, the rest of verse three, and he humbled thee, suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna, the literally, what is it, which thou knewest not, <laughs> again, what was this, Neither did thy fathers know. You looked at mom and dad. Hey, mom and dad, what is this? You know? Well, I've never seen this before in our lives. I have no idea. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Jump ahead to Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. You don't need to turn there. I'll, I'll read it. Christ, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards what? Hungry. Do you remember what the tempter said to him? And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command it these stones be made bread. A very similar word to manna. You know what Satan was tempting Christ to do? Literally what God had already done. They were hungry. I provided something. They had no idea how this all worked out. How did this happen? What is it? We don't know. But God provided by some, basically turning the rock. And AJ can attest to this. In that area that they are, are wandering, it's just rock. There's rock. And so the rock turns white and they pick it, the white up and they eat it. 
Christ is now also now on those rocks, and he is hungry, and the adversary says to him, basically, let me put this in the news or paraphrase, why don't you just do that thing again? You know the thing that you did already back for the nation of Israel? Why don't you just do that again? You can bend down and pick up just like they did right off the ground. So, if you are the son of God, that... What is it? That mass confusion back in the Old Testament? Do that again. I want to see you do that. What does Christ respond with? The very words here from Deuteronomy chapter 8. For it is written that man shall not eat by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of our God. What is he saying? Now, I've heard all kinds of interpretations. I've heard preaching on that passage. I, I've heard, uh, uh, I think, some things that are right on and some things that are, how did you come to that conclusion? But you know, here's, here's the reality. This is not about, well, hunger. You know, you just need to ignore hunger. You need to just uh, focus on the Word of God and read it every day. Well, you know, that's a valid statement, but that's not really what the statement is from our God. The, 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 the context is, is this. My obedience to our God, let me make it in simple terms, my obedience to my God should not be contingent upon my felt needs of the moment. In other words, just because I'm hungry, and I'm the Messiah, I'm the creator of the world, just because I am hungry does not mean that I, Christ had the means to do this miracle again. He had to obey God. More specifically, in this illustration of Christ, he had ought not to obey the adversary. And so what Christ is pointing out is, did he have the means to do that? Absolutely, he did. He already did it once. He could do it again. Could Christ have even made a, just a means that suddenly, uh, uh, he's a creator of our bodies, that suddenly, I don't feel hungry anymore. Good to go. Let's keep on moving. Uh, Christ had that means. But what he is pointing out then, and it was also being pointed out here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, is, hey, here's the very reality. We are not to be driven by our felt needs of even of hunger to be realizing that what God says, God will do, period. And in other words, if God says this is what you should do, we can't say, wait a minute, time out, I have an excuse, I have the little uh, uh, you know, hall pass here, <laughs> uh, I'm hungry. I don't think I can do that yet. The reality is, is what, what is being said here is, go obey God and he's going to take care of that hunger, but don't, don't stop in your obedience to God because your adversary is saying, wait a minute, time out, aren't you hungry? Isn't this a valid reason to not obey God? Isn't this a, a, a valid means by which uh, uh, you can just take care of your needs on your own and, and then you can get back to following God? Christ himself was tempted by the very reality of what had already been accomplished for the children of Israel. And he goes right back to this moment with the children of Israel and uses literally the exact statement that is said here with the children of Israel to say to Satan, hey, wait a minute. Our objective is not to obey you. Our objective is not to meet my need. My objective is to obey my God. And if God has said it, he will fulfill it. Our objective as the children of Israel was to follow God. Not go back to Egypt, but to follow God. You're going to have some hungry times, but God is going to obey. God's going to wait. God's going to provide while you obey. End of discussion. Go back to Egypt, but there won't be any manna on your way. Keep following me, and I'll continue to provide. Why? Because God said so. Because God said, I will provide. Because God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. So therefore, follow in obedience after me, because I've got this, this is the essence of what God is saying. I, I will take care of this. Lastly, not only do we need to learn humility, not just the reality that I need to be dependent upon my God, but the very reality that there are going to be times that God answers in ways, it's a what is it? It's a manna situation. It'd be great to have a testimony time. What are your manna situations? Because God still provides with manna today. What is it? How did that happen? Where did this come from? We have to learn how to pass the test. God gives us times of trial so that we learn that I need to just obey. Period. 
We can look at our checkbooks and say, well, I, uh, I, I don't know. We can look at our energy levels and say, oh, my goodness, I am exhausted. We can look at our hunger levels and say, I am so hungry right now. We can look at, and the, the list can keep going on. We can look at our, our medical diagnosis and say, well, I guess that's done. God says, just continue to obey me. You ought to live off of what I say, not off of what the adversary is saying, not off what your physical body is saying. Live off of what I am saying. God challenges us with the test. And can I say this? A lot of times those tests are far more difficult than the tests you'll get in school. High school, college, grad school, whatever it is. The testing of learning how to trust God and follow him are often going to be much more difficult than any other test we've ever faced. But there is blessing when we do. Thirdly, going back to verse 2, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or, and again I say, not. Jump to verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. What is in our hearts? How are we seeing those trials? How are we seeing what we are going through? We're not going to see the blessings in the trial unless we have a heart that says, my God loves me. Now, to be frank, going back to the, the, uh, the blizzard journey on foot, <laughs> uh, uh, not that I doubted God's love for me, but I, I can attest to this. I wasn't standing out in that blizzard condition with the snow beating against me and dragging my feet so I could keep, my, keep the van on the, the center line that was following after me. I wasn't singing, Jesus loves all the little children of the world. I, I wasn't necessarily singing that. Or what are some other songs? Oh, How He Loves You and Me. Uh, those weren't necessarily songs that, uh, uh, no, I, I think at one time, maybe it was just a delirium of the frozen brain. I think I did at one time start humming, uh, I am a soldier of the cross or something like that. It was just a good marching tune to keep going. But, but uh, you know, the, the human reality, the human nature is not to immediately go to the love of God in the midst of a trial, is it? What is Moses saying? God allowed 40 years of trials for you to challenge you, to teach you humility, to give you the test. Are you going to obey or are you going to give up? And he gives you the trials so that he might find out, not that he needs to know what's in our hearts, he already does, but to expose to us what's in our hearts. Do we still see the love of God? That's what verse 5 is saying. God did this because he loves you. I can imagine being a child of, of that generation who's only known wandering, who's had no home, whose only friends are the cousins in the tents next door. To hear God through Moses say, and he did that because he loves you. He does what? He loves me? If, if he loves me, why, why this? Why here? Why now? If God loves... You know how easy that is to come to that same conclusion today in our own trials. Wait a minute. I'm going through this because God loves me. And Moses says, and this as well is repeated in the New Testament, God chastens those whom he loves. Now I know that not every challenge and every trial is God's specific chastening because of our sin. Certainly we have the example of Job. Uh, to attest to that, but even using the example of Job, did not Job come to a heart of repentance by the end of Job? A man who was righteous, righteous enough at, in Job chapter 1 that God would say to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Concludes the book of Job with a heart of repentance before a holy God. So it's easy to say, well, Job was a righteous man and he still suffered, so it's not about a chastening of, the love of, chastening of God. Well, that's not how Job saw it. Job was a righteous man. He suffered, and he knew the love of his God and the chastening of his God. And he could conclude with the very reality is, I thought I knew about you, God, but now I really know you. You could almost use the word, now I really adore you because of what I've gone through. Finding the blessings in our trials. Learn humility. Learn that there's a test. <laughs> we're going to fast it. We're going to follow in obedience. Will we throw up our excuse and sideline ourselves? 
And thirdly, we need, to, we need to challenge our heart. We need to discover our heart. What's in our heart? What truly is in my heart as I'm going through those trials? Do I sense the love of God? Am I seeing it? Or am I balking from it? Am I arguing against it? If I want to see blessings in the trials, I need to learn to see God's love in those trials. And I would dare say, like the children of Israel, when we can see the love of God even in our circumstances, our difficult circumstances, I will dare say, you see his love, you will feel his blessing. Even when the speed bumps come at you one after the next in our life. What are we thinking in the midst of our trials? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the example of the children of Israel. Certainly we didn't have time to go through the rest of this chapter. But how you reminded them over and over again that they are going to be in a land that you promised them. They're going to be living in homes that they did not build. They're going to be drinking from wells that they did not dig. They're going to be enjoying all of life. And the danger for them was to forget who you were, who you are, what you have done, and what you continue to do. And I pray that the same reality would be in our hearts and our lives, that we'd be reminded now and tomorrow and every day thereafter of, of your goodness for us, even in the midst of trials that you so often use even for our good, for our benefit. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to turn in closing 517. I am resolved. Correct? 517. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight, things that are higher, things that are nobler. These have allured my sight. But are we resolved to follow him? Let's stand as we sing. Just first one. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are things that are nobler. What is your thinking in the midst of the trials? We need to resolve right now that when we hit that next trial, that's what we will do. And uh, I, I can guarantee you, you'll be overwhelmed by the blessings of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your faithfulness and even your forgiveness. When we go through so many circumstances of life and fail to see you, fail to see your love, fail to see your hand, fail to see what you are teaching us in the midst of those circumstances, Maybe we become so idolatrous in our own eyes that we put that, that trial, that circumstance as priority number one. But we thank you that your mercy is renewed every morning and your forgiveness is always there. And I pray that we be reminded again and again as we face whatever our next trial may be, or maybe we're going through it right now, that we would be reminded of the blessings that are still coming from you if we would but seal. We thank you for that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.